What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode four, part four of Tie Like a Pro. We're going to be wrapping this whole head design um, series up, and we'll be moving on from here. Um, and and today we're going to talk about jig flies. And I, I don't really think you know jig flies are probably the most common. They're probably um, the least technical, um, and, and kind of how you tie it or how you design it. And basically, you you know you put weight on a hook and it goes up and down. But there's a lot of things to consider about your head bulk and your head density and how you weight your fly and why you weight it that way. So for the most part on basically all my patterns I prefer weightless flies. When I do add weight it's usually an isolated point towards the head of the fly because I want it to dip and dive head first. I love weightless patterns that suspend so you never really see me put lead on the shank so we're not going to really go into that because that's not something I have a lot of experience with. We're just going to go over kind of you know cone heads, uh, how to hide a cone head, we're going to do uh, sculpin helmets, and we're going to do bait fish heads. So we have basically three where we're going to end up using three of Flyman uh, Fishing Company products and, I want, and, and, and the reason why I want to go into those specifically is because there are a lot more uh, I don't, I don't want to say fun, but, but they're a lot more fun than just doing lead eyes with a sparse head or a cone head with a sparse collar, right? Um, and something to be aware of if you do do those lead eyes or you do do that cone head, um, basically any jig fly can be fished with a jerk strip uh, and kind of made into a modified articulating style fly, but not all articulating style flies can be jigged. And it basically the only difference is your head density. When you put a lot of material on the head of the fly, uh, you just added water drag by that weight, so it's going to fall slower, right? If you just have a raw cone head uh, with a really sparse collar on a bugger, that sucker will drop like a rock, and you can jig that and fish pocket water, and you can almost dead drift it or high stick it on a seam or something like that. But the moment you put a big bushy, you know, laser dub collar on there, now it has a lot of viscosity that's going to slow it down on the fall, right? So you can tie like the same fly, you could tie a circus peanut for instance, a Russ Madden pattern, and you could tie it with uh, you know, a sparse ice dub head and a dubbing loop figure eight through the eyes and you'll get kind of a nice jig and fall retrieve uh, and you can also obviously fish that with a jerk strip retrieve nice and fast and, and get it some tail kicks in there, but you can tie the same pattern and do laser dub in a dubbing loop or strung fuzzy fiber in a dubbing loop or stack wool on it and you'll completely change the action to more of an articulating fly that's going to have a much slower fall rate and you may find that's what the fish are looking for on a particular day. Um, so stuff to consider, density, overweight, changes how it fishes. The other thing um, and we'll go into hook orientation at the end of this because we're going to do a sculpin at the end. Um, the other thing is when I think of jig flies, I think of floating lines. The lovely thing about a jig fly is obviously you can run it on a floating line system, which is often super beneficial. High dirty water, runoff conditions, or wade fishing, a lot of times floating lines are easier to manage, um, especially if you're fishing broken pocket water because your sinking line is going to fall between different current speeds and it'll have a lot of pull and tug on it, but your floating line will stay up on top and you can even use a mend to animate your fly and, and mend back and keep tight to it. And it's, it's all about keeping tight. You don't want to, like, you know, I'm not talking like a five foot mend here and then you can't set the hook. I'm just talking lifting your rod and keeping your line off the water and resetting it and using your mend to animate your fly and you have a jig fly fishing just subsurface but it's not truly like jigging you see what I'm saying it's just it's breaking up through the pocket water and then you can whoop, dead drift a little tail out and animate it back and mend it up a bank and there's a lot of stuff you can do with jig flies which is really cool so the jig flies we're gonna go over I mentioned the three heads that we're gonna do a hidden cone head with a fish mask a bait fish head and a sculpin helmet uh, the reason why I want to do those is because there's a lot of ways in a, in a jig fly style to um, blend styles. There's a lot of ways when you add weight to blend styles. With the bait fish head, we're going to go over kind of doing like a jiggy jerk presentation. So it's a jig fly and a jerk fly because we're going to have this tight, uh, vertically displaced pinch dub head behind this because uh, bait fish heads are slotted, right? And they're uh, counterbalanced and, and they're keeled. So we'll talk about that. Um, but they have this slot at the top, and you can build a head that's going to be tall and narrow, pinched by the bait fish head, so that while you're jigging it, especially in like a small medium weight, um, you know, at the top of your uh, retrieve, you know, every time you pop it up and it has this moment of it's not falling, it can catch and deflect and it'll catch lateral currents and have a little head wobble to it that you don't get from a cone head. Um, we'll do the, in the hidden uh, cone head version, right? 
you change how fast it drops by the density of the head, which we already talked about, and you can modify it simply, um, you know, your viscosity of your collar, it allows you to put eyes on a jig fly, and you can modify it from a jig fly to a articulating fly simply through how you stack the head. So it doesn't really, you know, you get basically two flies out of one fly, uh, basically just on how you tie the head. And then the sculpin helmet, the coolest thing about sculpin helmets, they're probably my favorite way to in invert a hook. Um, it's basically the only time I invert a hook, and we can go over that. Um, and also, uh, they surf. So it's not like if you do a lead-eyed sculpin that's really just designed to fall throughout the water column, uh, the moment you put a sculpin head on there, it's super flat like a zoo cougar head, but it's weighted. So it acts like an airplane jig, and it'll kind of cruise and surf and dip and dive, and it's super crazy cool how accurate that is to kind of how a natural sculpin behaves and when we get into hook orientation we'll talk about an aggressive response versus a food response um, actually i'll talk about that right now we'll just talk about hook orientation so uh just real quick i want to go over hook orientations because i filmed this once and i didn't love my answer so i'm coming back with a different one um, I love weightless flies. I just love weightless flies uh, with the exception of jig flies, you know, floating line pocket water situation that I kind of mentioned earlier, right? I think that's a really excellent way to use a floating line and a streamer presentation and, and kind of a way to navigate pocket water and high stick and dead drift and do all these fancy stuff and mending uh, uh, to animate your fly and stuff like that. So that that's a really cool, uh, you know, presentation. Um, but aside from that, I, I just love you know, sinking lines, neutrally uh, buoyant flies that suspend and hover and, and have this kind of infinite kill rate. And, and so going over hook orientation, I fish really aggressively. And when you think about uh, fishing, and we'll kind of break this up into kind of trout realm uh, river fishing, because in a trout realm river fishing, say you're fishing like the upper Madison, it might be two to three feet deep, uh, you can smack a fly, you're going to engage that fish's uh, kind of um, fight or flight response, right? You're intruding on them, you're startling them, you're scaring them, you're entering their territory and then running away. They're going to kill it, basically. Um, and whenever you smack a fly, retrieve a fly, you're fishing fast, you're fishing aggressively, you know, my flies are in the top foot of the water column. Um, and, and so when your fly is above a fish or eye level with a fish, this is my hook here, uh, just, you know, a fish is going to turn on that head, he's going to engulf that front head. You know, if your hook is down, he's coming in contact with your hook point. It's, it's very intuitive to me that way, that hook down, you just kind of, you know, if your hook's up, he's only, he can almost push it out of the way. Um, obviously a big fish is going to suck a lot of water in and, and your fly is going to disappear no matter what. But um, you know, it's just something to be aware of. But the moment you kind of get out of that trout realm, and this is an excellent uh, reason to invert a hook, um, if, if you're fishing a big river, or if you're fishing still water, or if you're fishing a lake, like flats fishing, you know, you're talking, you know, if you're hook, <laughs> especially in a still water situation, um, you're just that much more light, you can't engage that same response. Um, as soon as you move out of that shallow water river, uh, smack, fight, or flight, and you move into this still water or big water presentation, almost everything goes from predatory, uh, you know, um, wow, lost a train of thought, uh, predatory uh, territorial response to a food response. And it's all about matching forward and it's all about looking like, you know, if you're carp flask fishing, looking like a, you know, a little juvenile crayfish or something coming out of the mud and scooting around and, and so, or, or bonefish on the flats, whatever it is. Um, but you're just 100% more likely to come in contact with the bottom or even rest it on the bottom. And especially with, you know, a floating line system, little, you know, barbell eyes or whatever it is and you're just scooting it along the bottom um, that's an excellent reason to invert a hook and something we'll go over with this sculpin presentation because it's it can be a sculpin or a goby or a sucker something like that uh, you know you talk about great lakes fishing you're talking about fishing rock reefs or, or ledges or shelves and you're no longer in this predator prey kill mode but you're in this food response mode and so being able to take something uh, from you know in a river I don't fish sculpins in their natural habitat I don't scoot them gently along the bottom I smash and retrieve because I'm trying to start all fish and I just want him to visually recognize oh that's a sculpin boom and kill it like that's it 
I don't care, like, I don't care if sculpin are supposed to be on the bottom. This is, you know, a shallow river, a wounded sculpin. He's going to get flushed up to the top. He's out of control. He, he, he can't force himself into where he should be. He's out of position, and he's going to get killed. It's an opportunistic moment. But the moment you take that to a still water situation or a bigger river presentation, it's now non-predatory, it's now food, and you have to match the hatch, you have to be able to swim it like a sculpin or a goby on that rock reef, pull it out, oh, smallmouth bass just saw it, or a freshwater drum, or a big Great Lakes carp, boom, and they're gonna kill it, right? And so, uh, basically, just ask yourself, you know, if I'm fishing aggressive, or if I'm trying to engage that, that smack and retrieve predator-prey response, or if I'm fishing, you know, either shallow flats, or still water presentation, rock reefs, or maybe you're swinging a tail out, or something like that, where your fly's gonna come in contact, or bounce gravel, um, or even a dead drift situation. You can, you know, dead drift situation in a fast river, and you might be kind of like, you can almost high stick pocket water with a dead drift, it might benefit you to invert that hook. Um, so again, I'm gonna go over that with the sculpin uh, version that we're gonna tie at the end here. So if you wanna jump to that, that's cool. Um, but that's just what I wanted to mention. I love hook downs, fast, aggressive retrieve and weightless bait fish patterns. And I'll even run hook down on weighted patterns um, if I'm fishing aggressively. As soon as it's a still water or big slow river, or you know, it's not an aggressive response, but a food response, it can pay dividends to invert that hook. Um, and it allows you to get as close as you want to any type of bottom structure without truly hanging up. Um, unless you wedge your lead eyes between some rocks or something like that. So that's what I wanted to mention. Um, and let's get into tying these bugs. So as forementioned, all these bugs uh, incorporate my composite bugger brush that we'll go over in a different video for Tie Like a Pro. Um, and, and what I want to do for this first fly, if you're interested in this, it's just a bugger. Uh, you know, marabou, schlopping an ice dub, schlopping an ice dub. Um, uh, I think it's a size 2 trout predator and a size 1 trout predator from Arex. I'm going to put a small, medium bait fish head on this. And all I'm going to do is a stack dubbing head, and some you can see, look at this spacing, right? When you look at these, these uh, bait fish heads, they're slotted. Do you see that slot in there? Now you can use the kind of cheeking area of this bait fish head to pinch material. Very quick reference, go to my Truda's Demise tutorial, it's like two years old or something. But the whole bucktail spacing, long tall wing, it's a jerk jig fly presentation, it's a hybrid fly, jerk jig, jig and jerk, um, and you can see as soon as I slip that on, it pinches my bucktail. The whole point is to create a vertical sail with the pinched head uh, to kind of hybridize from a jig fly to a jerk fly. And the reason why is because at the top of a retrieve, when your fly suspends for a second, it can animate and wobble and deflect and, and catch lateral currents with a kind of tall dubbing sail. Um, so this spacing is ideal. You can see if I push this back, I have about a full hook eye. Um, and that's what we're going to use basically to put our dubbing and slip this over top and get a nice tight, uh, durable head. I'm going to tie it with my 140 power thread here. Just start this right up. And my hook eye in. Whoa! I lost all that. Starting over. Coming in with my 140 power thread. Try that again. And I'm just gonna do a laser dub head, top and bottom. Now, you can play with this when you tie your own bugs and you're, you're working through these uh, styles and techniques and whatnot. Um, I like, I'm very particular for whatever reason with how I stack dubbing, like if it's uh, 70 back, 30 front, or 50, 50, or 30, 70. I like to mess with that because I think it, it allows you to generate different silhouettes um, and, and you know, if you're using part of this laser dub for a wing material and part for a head material, or if you're using the full stack for a head material like on a sculpin, or if you want a short wing long head, which is what I'm going to do here. I might do it 50-50, but I like the taper of a 30-70. Um, and it's going to put more of that uh, kind of dubbing kind of into that thin sail pinched by that head. So this is quite a lot. Um, and I just... I don't want to, I want mostly, I'm using that weight to be kind of fished in a smaller water floating line setup. I'm going to maybe tie that in 40-60, catch that with a nice light uh, wrap, hit that with some small figure eights and put some good pressure on that. So you can see it just have like, you know, 35%, uh, and I have, <laughs> you can't see it, but I have like 65 hanging out the front. And then we'll just come over, 
and I'm gonna put uh, kind of like a, a laser dub and like a pale pink uh, cheeking material on the bottom. So something you can do, right? Uh, I just got my collars, top and bottom, um, nice and long. If you want to shorten that up, you can come in and just support this. Don't just rip it off or you'll pull it out from your tying point. Um, but you can control the length here just by pinching and pulling. If you want to add a little bit of taper to that top and bottom or if you have fibers that are too long, uh, you can just break them off. And when you break things, it creates an unnatural end that is more natural. You see what I'm saying? It creates an uneven end which is more natural instead of like cutting that flush with your scissors or, so, or something like that. Um, I need to push this back just a tad, my bait fish head. Uh, I need a little bit more room at my head so I'm just going to work that back. Perfect. And then I'm going to come in and this is not necessary but it can be helpful. And just put a little dab of, of gel style super glue top and bottom or, or sides or whatnot just to help hold this guy in place. Pinch all that back. Really push that on. Now because these are keeled, you have to understand that these have a top and bottom. Um, and especially once you get above uh, your small medium size, you get into your mediums and your larges, um, they have enough of a keel to invert hooks and start messing with your hook orientation, which is beneficial, but if you're not aware of it, it might hurt you in, in terms of how you actually wanted something to ride. Um, so, you can just see the steep chin side, uh, this is the correct orientation. You can look at it, you'll see there's a big heavy kind of uh, metal bar at the bottom of the heads that shows you which is the bottom and which is not. And then I just come in with monofilament uh, tying thread because it's clear. Um, if you want to do a hot spot like orange or something or fluorescent, you can come in with a hot spot color and then I'll hit uh, the nose of that with UV resin uh, just so it is completely see-through and you can't see any of that. So that's that's your bait fish head. Um, I like to attach eyes to these using that gel super glue um, and then I'll coat over the edge of those eyes with a UV resin for the best durability. But that's how that works out. And, and if you want, this is something that Kelly Gallup does which is a super nifty trick. Um, if you don't have UV, right, you don't need UV resin for the head, but you can come in with your Zepigap gel and you want it to be pretty loose. I like my hook up at an angle so that it'll seep in the head. Um, and instead of dabbing this off all the way, you want it to be pretty liquidy. And you can just soak those threads and it'll soak up into that head and it'll super glue your bait fish head to your hook. So I'm just purposefully being sloppy with my super glue here. I really want to hit those edges next to my hook eye um, and allow that to seep into that head. And then nobody likes super gluing your hook eye. You just come in with your bodkin and lightly open that up and you're good to go. So that ain't ever coming off of there. And I'll show you guys this real quick. But you got this nice tall thin head um, with quite a bit of dubbing, right? I use quite a dense amount of dubbing to create a vertical sail up there. Um, so you have uh, not a lot of weight. It's enough that it'll fish immediately and enough that it'll fish on a floating line. You can also fish it extremely effectively on a sinking line with an aggressive retrieve. But I also have a modified uh, kind of sail that'll allow it to catch some current and wobble and, and deflect and, and play with that uh, keeling action of the bait fish head with the hook um, and, and purposefully trying to destabilize that with a thin head, especially in the Trudis Demise. Uh, that principle holds true. And when you get into flat or fast water, it likes to wobble and roll, which is an ec excellent triggering me mechanism. That's on purpose, right? Um, and so, yeah, you can base your bait fish weight off of your keeling action if you're trying to invert it or uh, most importantly um, your hook mass and your keel weight depending on how tall your wing is which is why on like a, a true demise I like the size medium um, to help keel that fly so check that out we're gonna jump into a hidden cone head version here the, kin the hidden cone head is probably the best example um, on a trout nugget this is a trout nugget um, there's a cone head underneath the fish mask. The coolest thing is the fish mask. It's this kind of perfectly shaped uh, head. You can put a viscous collar on it to get an articulating jigging hybrid. Um, you can play with your cone head weight from mediums or large or brass or tungsten. So you can like generate four different weights of jigging or articulating hybrids and you get eyes on a cone head fly. Um, and this idea was inspired by Oscar Hagelin. Um, I hope I said your last name right, Oscar. Uh, he's got a website 
website called Time Flies by Oscar, which is an awesome kind of streamer blog, and he's a fly designer from Sweden. He's got some pretty sick patterns out. But I got the hidden cone head from him. I think it's his, uh, oh, I forget the name of the pattern, but that's who I got it from. So we're gonna hide a cone head underneath this fish mask. And this is a size uh, six millimeter fish mask from Flyman. And if I didn't mention on the previous slide, that was a, a size small, medium bait fish head. Um, I'm gonna come in here and you can, def you can see my composite bugger brush. I haven't wrapped that forward yet. And it's because I wanna show you this cone head positioning. And you simply, all you simply have to do is, you know, just slip that over your hook. You're like, oh, cool. I can still tie off. I can see my hook eye. It's pushed up uh, against that cone head and it's gonna seat firmly and snugly against that. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. Um, so your cone head is just, attached by thread wraps. So that's how I, the, the cone head's attached and it's all about spacing, it's all about how you hide it. Um, and if you want another example, you can do a jerk fly head over a cone head, which is what Oscar does. Um, it's where the idea came from. And, and you can see that on my mic drop. Um, so I'm gonna palmer this forward and then we're gonna stack a dubbing head in front of that cone head. So I got my composite bugger brush tied in and moved all the way up and I'm just gonna pick it out real quick in case there's any trapped fibers. And obviously, right, you could fish, uh, you know, if you put your cone head up right to your hook eye and obviously, you know, understand that where you position your weight's gonna determine how it jigs. Obviously, closer to your hook eye, the more it's gonna be head down. Uh, if you move that back, it's gonna be less uh, head driven. Um, but this is still a head, you know, a head driven uh, jigging presentation. Um, but if you were gonna do that, right, you could lightly veil laser dub, tie it off in the middle and then comb it back and you have completely hidden thread. Or you can just do a simple uh, dubbing loop with ice dub, dubbing loop with uh, laser dub, dubbing loop with strong fuzzy fiber, depending on how much push you want, how much jig you want. Um, so you just hybridize that. Um, but this is how you hide your cone head um, to get eyes and, and counter shading and cool stuff like that. So. Just gonna come in. I'm gonna try to keep the dubbing uh, kind of close to my hook there. I'm gonna come in with some olive laser dub. And again, you just you control the head density. Do you want this to be a viscous head or do you want it to be a sparse wing material? That's simply all you have to ask yourself. I'm gonna tie this in the same way I did um, on the the bait fish head. I'm gonna tie that in 30 back. Maybe that's 60, 40, 40 back, 60 front. Flip that over. Come in with some silver here. Laser dub is an absolutely beast of a material for doing these kind of heads. Um, especially being kind of an acrylic base, it's gonna be a little bit uh, slipperier and, and not at super bulky, so you can definitely hybridize you know, in that jig style. Uh, with heads and counter shading without uh, generating too much water push, all right? Because the whole point is to actually get a fly that that kind of jigs or kicks on a jerk strip. So you come in, pinch that to the sides again, so you get a nice clean veil. I'm literally taking my two colors and pinching them together, dragging the top towards the middle and the bottom towards the middle, um, so that when I comb this out and I put my head on it, I get a clean color separation. I like that. You don't. You can obviously make it modeled or, or blend the two together or whatever you want to do, but I like to comb them out clean. And I got a nice sparse head on here. And then you just simply take your, your bait fish head, slip it over. You got this absolutely flawless, you know, uh, epoxy head. Not truly epoxy, but this head here. And then you just add a small very light thread dam. Again, this is when your monofilament comes into play that's mentioned in, in episode one, right? Because this doesn't have any color to it. And then I'm gonna cure this with UV resin. And so my favorite way to uh, adhere these to a fly, and I'll show you how to do it because there's a lot of ways that you can do it, and this is what has worked best for me. Uh, so I have a thread dam in front of this, right? And that's not going anywhere. Um, and then what you wanna do before you do anything, make sure your head's level. Uh, you know, it's oriented left and right. It's centered on your hook eye. You want it completely centered on your hook so that your water push, because these heads push a little bit of water, is completely evenly distributed. So it's vertical and it's centered, right? Just two important little topics there. And then what I love to do is you take a UV resin. Uh, this is Deer Creek's UV Diamond Fine Flex. 
Now this head, there's a little uh, a gap, and I'll take this out of the vise here, um, but there's a, a gap right here between your hook and the beginning of the mask. I'd call it the mouth. That mask has a wide mouth to it to fit over a range of hook eyes, right? You take that mouth and you're gonna fill it, you're gonna saturate it with a UV resin and it's gonna fill the inside and the outside edge of the mask and it'll soak up in there. And again, you don't have to do this, but it's the kind of cleanest looking uh, way and it makes for a really durable head. But you cover the inside edge, right, because it's soaking up inside the fly and the outside edge. And then you take that, hit that with your torch, and you'll have a epoxy inside and outside. It'll adhere to the dubbing, but at the same time, it's through to the hook eye and then out over top of the mask. So the mask can't rotate, loosen, wobble, all the any uh, kind of air pocket or negative space is all filled now with resin. And you have this um, really durable head that's not going to twist or rotate or pop off or do anything weird like that. So I'm not gonna sit here and make you guys watch that. I would cure that for a while because you're going through the mask into the dubbing. Um, that laser pen has a ton of power and is absolutely perfect for that. Um, but I'll finish this later. So that's how you hide a cone head. And then I like to put one size smaller eyes on my mask. This is a six millimeter mask. I'd probably put five millimeter eyes. The reason being is there's gonna be some over space uh, from your eye now to the mask that when you Put your, your super glue in there, make sure your eye's centered, and then you fill that cavity with resin. Um, your resin can now adhere to the inside of that eye cavity, and it, and, and it fills that eye cavity flush um, and helps protect those eyes. So that's the hidden cone head fish mask version um, for hiding weight. And again, mediums, uh, you know, small, medium, large cone heads in brass and tungsten, you just have six fly weights that you can alter um, to create an articulating fly or a jig fly and how heavy and how advanced that jig is depending on your, your line or your pocket water or your still water, or how deep you want to fish or if it's a floating line or a sinking line or all that stuff. And that's going to totally come into play um, for the infinite fly principle as you're going to find out. So this the last one we're going to do is a sculpin helmet. I'm using this size small. Uh, they have three sizes. They have small, large, and extra small. Um, I haven't played with the extra smalls yet, but the smalls are my favorite for fishing really, really, really tiny creeks and for fishing uh, on a full sinking line or an intermediate line, kind of in a Great Lakes scenario. But this is, again, a, an articulated composite dubbing brush bugger here. And you can see, I'm going to actually invert this. I have my hook eye bent here uh, just a tad. I have my hook eye bent up just a tad so I can slip this over, get a nice clean thread bump, and then my hook eye is in line. It's going to ride. You can see it right there on my pinky. It rides in line with my fishing line because my fishing line is probably going to be above this in my creek fishing scenario. Um, and, and so whenever you, you uh, invert a hook, and you're going to invert it with weight, and my favorite weight being uh, probably the sculpin helmets, um, the smaller, you know, if you, if you add weight to a fly, I forget where I talk about this, but it's uh, a good video, one of mine. Um, when you add weight to a fly, uh, you have an attachment point, right? You see, this is, you're going to attach weight right here. Now, you can put weight underneath your hook, and it's going to help it keel. You can put weight above, and it's going to help flip it over. Now, if you want to invert a hook with a really light amount of weight, um, it pays dividends to tie on a jig hook. Uh, jig hooks, this hook I would be, you know, it'd stop right here and it'd shoot up at a 60 degree angle. And what happens is, is you're putting mass below the place where your fly line attaches to the fly. Uh, and that's super key because wherever you put that mass below your attachment point, it keels. Same way ball jigs keel uh, for jigging, you know, live bait and stuff like that. It's like the only thing that matters is your weight relative to where your attachment point is. So like I could probably invert this with like large bead chain eyes. I would just have to either tie in a jig hook or bend this hook up higher. Now not all hooks will allow you to bend them. This is an A-Rex uh, size 4 traditional shrimp hook. Um, I got pretty good success bending these and it doesn't hurt the durability or anything like that. Or you can just look into jig hooks. Um, but when you bend this hook shank and you put the you know your hook shank is running level you bend it up 
and you put weight beneath your attachment point, attachment point and weight, it increases that distance. That becomes your keeling distance. The longer that distance, the lighter weight you can use to invert a hook. So if you intend to invert a hook and you don't want it to be heavy, you need a long kind of shank mouth attachment point to weight ratio. Uh, if you use a lot of weight, you can get away with, you don't have to bend it at all. You can put you know medium lead eyes on this and that'll invert that, no problem. Um, and it's all relative to your hook keeling and the distance between your attachment point and if you want to bend it. Um, so it's just stuff to be aware of. I like to bend it uh, with these uh, sculpin helmets because it creates a seamless transition from the mouth of my my helmet because the mouth on these is angled up and it also keeps my fishing line running in line with my hook eye uh, which allows you to kind of dead drift it and pause it and your fly will ride level um, which is really nice so I'm gonna do a deer hair collar on this and because I have a hook point pointing up I'm gonna actually stack it on the top and walk it around I'll show you guys how to do that then we're just gonna do a dubbing head and again Something I see this all the time, when people do uh, deer hair collars on these scalp and helmet flies, I like my collar to be flared to the max. So the spacing of this, and you can kind of see it, the spacing of this is so that my helmet does not touch these little thread dams right here that I'm gonna seat my deer hair collar in. Everything's spaced the same way it's spaced on uh, a sex dungeon, right? The way I, I space my collar so that I can tie in my deer hair and this helmet does not touch the deer hair at all because I don't want it to compress and touch my deer hair. Um, so just, you know, work on your spacing, put this on, hold it there, start your thread, make your little thread dam uh, so that your two thread bumps are behind your mask so that your uh, sculpin helmet doesn't touch your deer hair work. So that's how that's all spaced out and proportioned. I'm gonna come in with a gel spun because we're working with hair, right? Start that up front, work it into my thread dam, half hitch it so it's kind of locked in place. And then I'll walk that up so that you guys can see me attach this and walk it to the underside because it's a little it's a little tricky, but it doesn't have to be tricky. Um, I don't want a lot of deer here because this is a pretty uh, small gap hook. It's only a size four. It's a pretty small fly in general. Um, but it's only size 4, so I'm going to try to keep this nice and sparse by my standards. <laughs> keep that in mind. Sparse by my standards. Still pretty bushy collar. And this is going to be your pec fins and the big kind of fat head profile and all that good stuff. So I'm just going to measure that off. I want it to kind of bleed uh, basically into my hook point right there. I like that distance. I always like to go big on my, my collars. I'd rather have it too big than too small, so just air on that side. Right, you're gonna catch that, add some tension, add some tension, flare it for the most part, walk it over with your thumb, and this is just like stacking deer hair, right? The way we stack deer hair on our cougar head or stacked it on our dungeon head. Thumb on top to flare it against, finger on the hook eye so you don't hook your, or uh, hurt your jaws or your vise or slip your hook or anything. Push into that, and then wrap through your butts to trap it, everything down so it's not going to rotate and twist and fall out and do anything crazy. Bring it in front, and then I'll actually whip finish that off and do my dubbing with my normal 140 power thread. So you can see how much that collar's flared like crazy, and my, my helmet doesn't close any of that. It doesn't close any of it because it's all behind my helmet, which is exactly what I want. You can obviously change that to what you want, but that's exactly what I'm looking for. If I can grab my thread, I'll start my thread. Got that one notch too tight. Then I'm going to come up. Now I want that collar to relax a little bit on the top especially, so I'm going to throw some light thread wraps up in there. And then what I like to do is, is I just like to loosely stack. And when we talked about stacking our, our uh, jerk fly heads, it's a really tight pinch, top and bottom only. Um, and today, it's basically the opposite. I pull out as much as I kind of want, which I don't want a, a ton. I'd be happy with about that. And then I'm gonna take this, pinch and pull, uh, get it all aligned, and I'm just gonna split it in half. And I'm gonna tie one uh, stack on your side and one stack on my side. So that's the total fibers I want. And then instead of stacking this, it's going to be about 50-50. Instead of stacking this with a super tight pinch only on the side, I'm going to make it kind of loose 
Uh, so it, it moves a little bit to the top of the hook shank and a little bit to the bottom of the hook shank. And I'm just trying to veil over this deer hair collar. It's almost like tying, I wouldn't say like sloppy, but it's, it's kind of like tying, you know, not clean on purpose for the purpose of, of veiling over that, that deer hair collar. And I like to build up a little thread base in front of this so that my helmet has something to adhere to. I'm going to throw a dab of gel super glue on top of all that. We'll come in and whip finish. Comb that out. Throw a dab of super glue and I have a little thread base I built up right here. Um, so I have a place for that, that helmet to adhere to and, and fill in. Slide that over top just like so nice wide head make sure it's uh, perpendicular to your hook orientation so that you're going to get the maximum keeling effect and it's not twisted or rotated and then you simply come in with some monofilament clear thread or black or whatever matches your helmet and you put a thread base right at the mouth then I'm going to fill the identical way I did with the mask with some UV resin or you can super glue it the same way we did with the bait fish head um, so that it's physically glued to your your hook and threads and all that good stuff and it's not going to slip or rotate or move on you. And then the identical way to the bait fish head, I like to just use gel super glue to adhere my eyes inside the cavities and then I coat them with a UV resin which shouldn't really need that much instruction. So That is your inverted sculpin um, articulated kind of Great Lakes goby if you will which is money. So that's jig flies. That right there is jig flies. Um, move this stuff up and, and such. Hopefully you found that interesting. It's an absolutely incredible way to, to really uh, blend styles, you know, so that you have this jig and surf with the sculpin helmet. You have this hidden cone head um, that you can bleed into a jig fly or articulating fly just based on density. Um, instead of, you know, a cone head, you can slop a slap, slop a uh, slap a bait fish head over that that's going to pinch your dubbing or pinch your bucktail on a Trudeau's demise or whatever you decide to do um, to create a fly that not only jigs but also has some lateral movement to it. Um, it's a really cool way to hybridize flies and they fish, you know, hook up, hook down, however you want to integrate that weight, whether you're fishing fast and aggressive and shallow or, or deep and slow and imitating natural food source and, and all that good stuff. So, that's jig flies. Now, these heads have in no way been comprehensive, and that's kind of in, on purpose. I just want to show you some very uh, simple heads in each category that we can blend together and pull from when we get to the infinite fly principle um, so that you guys can maximize your box's potential, your, your ability to generate a lot of flies that fill a lot of different spaces, which is what the whole thing's about. It's not about designing new flies or coming up with ideas, it's about taking one fly, generating it to an infinite possibilities to fill your need on the river. So hopefully that uh, you like that and, and thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the infinite fly principle, hopefully in a week. Cross your fingers. See you then.